Welcome to Paxos's Safety and Digital Asset Compliance Webinar. Um, I am your host, Becky McLean. I'm the Director of Communications here at Paxos. Thank you for joining us today. I'm joined by my, my esteemed colleagues, and we will get started very soon, but just a few technical things to go through before we get started. First off, um, some logistics. This webinar is being recorded and um, will be available after use. So you'll get access to all this great content from my colleagues. Um, and then we will also be having a Q&A after the formal remarks. So you can submit questions that you have and we'll try to address as many as possible. So before we dig into the meat of the presentation, um, just a few details if you're not familiar with Paxos. Paxos is a leading regulated global uh, financial market infrastructure platform. We specialize in blockchain services. We have hubs in New York, London, and Singapore. We're regulated in New York and Singapore. And we have been in this game since 2012. So we are really experts here. Um, we are you know, the backend provider for many well-known institutions like PayPal, Interactive Brokers, Mercado Libre. And what's different about Paxos is that we focus on providing the solutions to B2B companies. So we are not going to be the known brand. We're working behind the scenes so that our, we enable our clients and their end users. Um, here are some details about us. Um, you know, we have great backing and we are continuing to grow even uh, despite kind of volatile markets these days. So we are core products. We focus on stablecoin issuance. So we have um, the USDP stablecoin, which is a dollar backed regulated digital asset. Um, what most of us or what many of you may know us for is our crypto brokerage product where we are providing the back end solution to enable companies like PayPal, Interactive Brokers, Nubank, Mercado Libre. Um, we're providing that infrastructure so that their users can get digital assets. So if you are on Venmo today and you're trying to get Bitcoin, that solution is powered by Paxos. Um, we are also using blockchain to improve how settlement happens between uh, global institutions. So we have a commodities settlement platform that really um, enables more efficient settlement for global markets trading. Okay, so now we're going to get into the details. And first off, I'm going to welcome my colleague, Sarah Breslow, who is the Senior Regulatory Council Leader at Paxos, who's going to talk about some logistics there. So passing it over to Sarah. Thanks, Becky. Good morning. Um, all right. This is the, the list of topics. I'm going to move to the next slide, though. Uh, Great. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Sarah Breslow, and as Becky mentioned, I'm senior counsel in Paxos's legal group. I've previously counseled TradFi institutions regarding their compliance obligations, and what I've been struck by since joining Paxos is the extent to which understanding traditional compliance principles is essential to successful regulated blockchain. I will walk you through a few key principles that are not unique to the blockchain industry, but rather apply to all regulated financial institutions in the United States. There are a lot of acronyms in the compliance space, so I will also define common terms as they come up. All right. So first, there are two key provisions that govern regulation of anti-money laundering or AML programs in the United States. First, the Bank Secrecy Act or BSA passed in 1970 establishes the basic framework for AML obligations imposed on U.S. financial institutions. Among other requirements, the BSA requ requires financial institutions to keep records and file reports on financial transactions that may be useful in investigating and prosecuting money laundering and other financial crimes. The Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, or FinCEN, is a bureau within the, de the Treasury Department and administers the BSA. The Patriot Act was enacted in 2001 in response to the September 11th attacks. Among other things, the Patriot Act amended and strengthened the BSA. It imposed a number of AML obligations on regulated financial institutions, 
including establishing an AML compliance program. Overall, when we talk about the fundamental pillars of any compliance program, we start with a risk assessment, which is intended to outline the risks and inform the development and implementation of corresponding internal controls. Internal controls may include implementing and maintaining policies and procedures, managing a customer identification program, suspicious activity reporting and information sharing with other financial institutions and government authorities, and record keeping. The other pillars are designating a BSA or AML officer responsible for managing AML compliance, training for all employees and board members with specialized training for AML personnel, independent testing of the AML program, and customer due diligence, which is known as CDD. That includes drilling down on beneficial ownership, having customer risk ratings, conducting enhanced due diligence, transaction monitoring, and investigations where necessary. Um, all U.S. persons are also required to maintain a sanctions compliance program. This is on top of the AML requirements. OFAC, or the Office of Foreign Asset Control at Treasury, expects that regulated financial institutions sanctions programs include a demonstrated management commitment to sanctions compliance by appointing dedicated compliance personnel, providing compliance teams with adequate resources and support, and promoting a culture of compliance, conducting a risk assessment of the organization to assess touch points to the outside world, including potential exposure to sanctioned jurisdictions or persons, and finally, internal controls to identify activity prohibited by U.S. sanctions tailored to the organization's day-to-day -day operations and activities. Next slide. At Paxos, we have two primary AML compliance regulators in the United States. Since 2015, the New York State Dep Department of Financial Services, or DFS, has regulated entities operating as virtual currency businesses in New York State under the BIT license regulation or the limited purpose trust company provisions of the New York banking law. Paxos is a limited purpose trust and therefore it's subject to traditional aspects of New York State banking law, including certain controls for AML programs. We are also subject to the DFS regulation part 504, which requires certain compliance controls for a BSA AML program, including transaction monitoring. The BIT license regime also includes a specific requirement for licensees to comply with all applicable laws, designate a qualified compliance officer, and maintain and enforce written compliance policies, including policies with respect to anti-fraud, anti-money laundering, cybersecurity, privacy, and information security. Additionally, Paxos is registered with FinCEN as a money services business, or MSB. FinCEN requires registration for all MSBs, a term for anyone doing business with money or other store of value. FinCEN issued guidance in 2011 specifying that businesses involved in transmission of crypto assets or other convertible virtual currencies are money services businesses and therefore must register with FinCEN and implement the AML compliance program I described a few minutes ago. In the United States, Regulators have applied the concepts they use in traditional finance to the crypto industry. FinCEN has issued clarifying guidance on virtual currency on several occasions. Um, you know what, Becky, I think next slide. Additionally, in 2020, the AML Act or AMLA required Treasury to report on financial trend analyses every six months, two of which have focused on ransomware and the use of virtual currency. Traditional principles of financial crimes prosecution have also extended to the virtual currency industry across several different regulators. SDNY, for example, has pursued two traditional insider trading cases on wire fraud theories, one against an OpenSea employee for trading NFTs based on inside information and against a Coinbase employee and his associates. Uh, DFS has also issued consent orders based on programmatic AML deficiencies at Coinbase, Robinhood Crypto, and Bittrex, and those focused primarily on um, the, the key pillars of an AML compliance program I just described. 
Finally, OFAC and FinCEN have targeted Bittrex and OFAC designated Tornado Cash and other illicit actors in the crypto space. So as you can see, uh, traditional regulators are focusing on crypto to make sure that they follow the traditional rules um, that other financial institutions have followed. Overall, when evaluating the risk of laundering virtual currency, it is different than cash, but there are often similar analogs. And with that, I'll hand it off to Kate to explain how compliance and blockchain can enhance our understanding of a virtual currency transaction. Great, thanks so much, Sarah. Um, as uh, Sarah mentioned, my name is Kate Ironman. I'm the BSA officer at Paxos. I previously worked at the US Treasury Department on AML and sanctions policy issues, as well as in traditional fi finance compliance programs. And collectively, this experience has afforded me the opportunity to see BSA compliance from a number of different angles. In light of this experience, I found it notable during my time at Paxos to learn about the different tools and different capabilities that are specific to the crypto industry. I'm gonna walk you through a few of these tools and I'm gonna highlight some key principles to explain how compliance in the blockchain space has the ability to build upon traditional pillars in AML CFT compliance programs. I'll start here by highlighting a few key features. First, the blockchain itself is public and immutable. This means that there is a permanent record of all transactions that occur on the blockchain. This feature supports compliance related investigations into transactional patterns, as well as customer activity. Second, blockchain analytics tools help visualize the flow of funds and provide data regarding transactions that occur on the blockchain. These tools can also support real-time screening to prevent transactions with sanctioned wallet addresses, just as you could with traditional finance payment screening systems. Lastly, there is what we call a freeze and seize capability, which is wholly unique to crypto. Freeze and seize is a term that we use to describe a functionality that is built into smart contracts and allows tokens to be frozen, thereby preventing onwards transactional activity. If you go next, um, you'll see we'll dive a little bit deeper on the topic of blockchain analytics tools. These tools are used to examine documented information on blockchains, and they support greater transparency into transactional activity. Specifically, not only do they provide visibility into direct point-to-point -point payments, as you would see with traditional payment screening systems, but they also provide visibility into, into transactions that occur on the blockchain, even after they have left the originating payment source. In other words, using blockchain analytics tools, you can track a payment as it moves through multiple wallet addresses, and you can alert to potentially illicit activity at any of those onward points. This is different from monitoring fiat transactions, which, which can only be tracked from one point of sale to the next. To help illustrate, think about when you take cash from an ATM. After the cash is withdrawn, traditional tools cannot track any subsequent payments with that cash. This ability to track a payment via onwards hops on the blockchain gives compliance professionals the opportunity to analyze and to investigate illicit activity that may be directly or indirectly connected to the originating transaction. Also, importantly, these detection tools take into account typologies that are specific to the crypto space. This includes those related to mixers, tumblers, darknet markets, and ransomware nodes, just to name a few. In all of these ways, blockchain analytics helps trace the flow of funds and links it to potentially suspicious activity, which collectively support compliance investigations. Working in the compliance space in crypto, Becky, if you go to the next slide. Um, working in the compliance space in crypto, I often hear people say to me, crypto is just used by criminals, it's just used to launder money or to evade sanctions. As I mentioned earlier, the blockchain is public and it's immutable. Therefore, compliance teams and investigators have a record available to support their investigations of potentially illicit or suspicious activity. And crypto is not necessarily the preferred choice when trying to go under the radar. In fact, in FinCEN issued guidance in 2022 regarding Russia, FinCEN stated that widespread evasion of our sanctions using methods such as cryptocurrency has not been seen. Additionally, it is important to note that while virtual currency is believed to be anonymous, in reality, it's actually pseudonymous. Every transaction is tied to a unique wallet address. 
and regulated institutions still maintain KYC CIP obligations on their customers. One tool that I mentioned earlier that supports efforts in crypto is the ability to freeze and to seize tokens. Smart contracts enable the ability to freeze the tokens so that they are identified as having been associated with illicit activity, they can be frozen and prevented from moving onwards. One real world example of this is with respect to FTX. In November, 2022, Paxos, at the direction of US law enforcement, froze Paxos issued assets associated with four wallet addresses on the Ethereum network, totaling roughly $19 million. These tokens were previously on the FTX.com platform and had moved to unknown wallet addresses over the previous 24 hours. The case study show, this case study shows the power of blockchain technology. When news reports were released regarding the FTX hack, Paxos was able to use blockchain analytics to trace the assets and to locate where they were held off the Paxos platform. At the direction of law enforcement, we were then able to use blockchain technology to freeze the assets in these unhosted wallets, to burn them, and to return them to the authorities following formal court orders. This is a great example of the power of blockchain specific tools and mitigating the risks of illicit activity. With that, uh, thank you. I'll thank you for your time. And I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Alex, who's going to discuss key areas for consideration when evaluating compliance programs of a potential partner. Thanks so much, Kate. Hi, everybody. I'm Alex Gutler. I lead Global Partnerships here at Paxos, and I'm excited to talk to you about ways to get a hand with some of these things for your business. So if we go to the next slide, the big takeaway here is you are not alone. There are lots of different companies out there that can help you strengthen your compliance practice as well as operate the business once you get up and running. So I broke these into three distinct categories here. The first are consulting and advisory companies. So one thing that some of you may know, and, and many of you I would guess don't, is that the traditional consulting companies, the Deloitte's and EY's and McKinsey's of the world, all have really big digital asset practices. And many of the people on those teams are actually on the uh, the digital asset side for things like risk and auditing and uh, and regulatory controls. And so it's really, really a, a big part of the ecosystem that I think can help people understand what they should be doing in the space. So to start out here on the strategy side, if you're still at the early stages of building a digital asset strategy or you're thinking about building a digital asset strategy and you haven't even gotten started yet, a lot of these companies are really helpful at walking you through what your various options are. If you or your leadership team says, hey, we, we think we should be considering getting into the digital asset space or tokenizing some sort of thing that we own or participating in one of these markets, but we don't know what to do. I think that's a great place to start is these consulting companies can really help you understand what are the menu of options out there that you and your team should consider. And then you can understand, you know, which of those most closely align with your strategy long term for your overall business and how you could get started. So that's the first thing. We also see these companies honestly helping review uh, and even build things like RFPs or RFIs if you're trying to learn, um, you know, more about vendors in a specific category. Um, that these consultants will actually be brought in to help run that process and make sure that you're selecting the right partner. The next is around risk and control. So as I said, there's a lot of opportunities where these teams, and just as uh, Kate was saying earlier, these teams are already focused on helping people on the traditional non-digital asset side of their business. And so as a corollary in the digital asset space, they also have teams that are really focused on how do we build or modify, if needed, our risks and controls for the digital assets world. The next is around accounting and auditing. You know, some of the firms that I mentioned are some of the big four accounting firms. And so it's really helpful to understand from the people who are helping you on your accounting and auditing side of things, how should we think about digital assets? You know, if you look around the world, there's lots of different ways that people treat digital assets, whether they need to be 
on your balance sheet, not on your balance sheet. That's a question that comes up when we're doing deals with clients around the world. And so I think having a trusted partner like one of these firms help you understand that is really, really critical. And I think not just for you. One of the things that we've seen these partners be really effective at is building consensus across the organization. And I think, you know, to be totally honest, if you talked to a head of risk or head of accounting at one of the clients that we speak with who are going to build this process and, and you got them in a room by themselves and you said, I know you've signed off on building this, but how do you actually feel about your team's ability to stand this up? I think a lot of people would say, look, we're excited about it, but we've never done this before. And so any help that they can get would be really valuable. And so I think that's one of the reasons why we see almost all of the companies we work with tapping into these networks of consultants. And when I say consultants, it can be a variety of things. So the next thing we have listed here is regulatory counsel. Um, I know we have some lawyers uh, and maybe even some regulators joining today. There's a lot of help that people can get from counsel to really figure out what is the right thing we should be doing? What is the temperature of the regulators in the market or markets that we operate in? And how should we think about entering the space? So all of those are really helpful on the consulting and advisory side. The next is something that Kate also mentioned, which is the blockchain monitoring companies. So there's a handful of these out in the world. Some of them are, are independent companies. Some have been acquired by other companies. And the first thing that I think people get a lot of value from these companies from is training. So a lot of the time that these teams are spending with companies that are building a digital assets business is really speaking to what I was talking about a second ago, which is getting everyone across the organization trained up on what is this new world that we're entering and how should we think about it? How does our normal sort of business as usual processes how do those processes get affected or not get affected as we build this digital asset business? So that's that's a really important thing that I think gets everybody a foundational level of knowledge about the, the blockchain world. And you know, one of the things that we say, and this applies to regulators as well as it does for anybody in the private sector, is when you enter this space, no one is downloading a file into the brains of people to say, this is everything you need to know about crypto or digital assets over the last 15 years. It's all very much learned by education and meeting with people and learning little by little. And so I think you can't really underestimate the value of being properly trained and just building that base layer across your organization because it's going to allow people, as we are focused on compliance in this webinar, is really going to allow people to um, see around corners and truly understand not only the first order, but the second and third order implications of the business that you're building. And so that really can help your business um, stay ahead of things, which is vitally important because this world moves very quickly. Um, the next thing is actually using the tools themselves. So the tools themselves are very, very helpful at finding things that you need to know about for running your business, as well as working with law enforcement if anything should happen and you know you need to file a suspicious activity report or anything like that. Next is something that we found is, is actually quite interesting, which is how can you take the signal that you're getting from some of these tools and actually apply it into your core business that has nothing to do with digital assets. So a real world example, we were with a bank in Latin America a couple of weeks ago, who is using one of these tools to actually help bolster its underwriting and risk processes across its core business. So they're able to see what different um, partners a particular user or company is interacting with via this blockchain monitoring tool and actually fold that into the way they run their business. So it actually ends up enhancing the safety and compliance of their overall business, not just the digital asset business. So I think we see lots of interesting use cases there, and those are only getting built up more and more. Um, and the last category is around systems integration and operational support. So if you don't have all of the people internally that can build all of this, we're really able to uh, see some of these consulting companies and outsourcing companies take on that work 
So if you need people to run the actual um, operations, uh, whether it's the core business itself, some aspect of your compliance business, there are companies both globally and regionally that can help stand these up. And many of our clients are partnered with these organizations. And next, um, you know, again, if you are in a position where you really need to staff up just to get things off the ground, and then maybe you'll take it over, there's a model where you can work with these partners and maybe they help you get started and they roll off after six months or something like that. We can move on to the next slide. And this slide is really to help people understand what are the questions I should be asking if I'm going to partner with somebody in the digital asset space. And some of these move beyond just compliance, as you can see. Um, and in the next slide, we'll, we'll even get even further um, into just overall things you should be considering. But on the first category here, licensing. So how is the company actually licensed to operate in the jurisdictions that you care about operating in? Um, the next is based on the, the regulators that they work with, are they actually in good standing with those regulators or are there a number of issues that they're working through? The final point here is from a geographic expansion perspective, are you and your business aligned with where you want to go? So if they're really only focused on one market and you operate across 10 markets and you want to launch a digital assets business, then you're either going to have to find other partners for those, or you're going to have to understand what their roadmap is to expand into those other nine markets. So next on the regulation piece, understanding really who the primary regulator is that this company works with and whether there are others that they're starting to add. So to, again, speak about Paxos, we work primarily under the Department of Financial Services as our primary regulator. We also, over the last couple of months, have stood up a relationship with the Monetary Authority of Singapore as we received our major payments institution license. So understanding things like this about the companies you're working with is really critical. Again, a lot of this is interwoven and it ties to the fact that you might want to operate in multiple jurisdictions with the company. So really understanding what their capabilities are is really important. Um, next is understanding, do you actually trust the oversight of that particular regulator? So, you know, there are many different regulators around the world. They are not all created equally. Some are incredibly well respected. Some might be still building their reputation in the industry. So knowing and talking to other people in the space to understand who the most trusted regulators are. And, you know, another thing that we see coming up a lot in the digital asset space is understanding, you know, how clear, how consistent is the regulation in that market that you're going to be or your partner is going to be subjected to. Um, next on the compliance side, understanding, you know, are there BSA, AML sanctions officers at the company that are responsible for looking over all of this? Um, next is understanding just really how is the compliance organization set up? I think if you look at a company like Paxos, there are dozens of people that report into Carolina Ceballos, who is our chief compliance officer, and understanding what all those different teams are doing, how you might interface with those company uh, employees throughout the time that you're partnered with them is really, really important. Um, and last, as a part of that, you know, many of you are compliance people, you understand you know, uh, a company is not necessarily able to always share 100% of uh, the policies and the things happening behind the scenes. But I think you should really try to get as much detail as possible about what policies are in place. You'll learn a lot of this through an onboarding process if you choose to work with that partner. But like Paxos, again, to, to reference some of our practices, we have a two-page document that when you're onboarding to Paxos, it walks through all of the different things that we need from an onboarding perspective. And we just try to work to make it as clear as possible what things are needed. Um, on the Paxos side. The next thing, and, and really the last, and, and perhaps the most important, honestly, after what we've seen over the last couple of quarters of volatility in the digital asset space, is reputation. So again, understanding, is this company in good standing? And this isn't limited to what the regulator thinks about them, if they have a regulator that oversees them. It's also, what do people in the market think about them? If you mention their name, do people say, that's a really great trusted brand and one that I would want to work with or that we are proud to work with? Or is it a company that when you mention their name, people say, 
oh, wow, everyone knows that that company cuts corners. So that's a really important thing. There's obviously a lot of nuance and gray area to that. There's not, you know, like a, a black and white definition of these things. But I think the more people you speak with, the more um, signal that you will get to understand how this company is viewed in the market. Um, the next, you know, is just about has the company ever been accused of misrepresenting products? And the last is, are they audited by a third party regulator? I think this this has to do with, uh, sorry, not a third party regulator, but just a third party auditor. And I think um, this has to do uh, similar to what we spoke about on the regulation side of saying, I don't just want to trust that this company is doing the right thing because they say that they're going to do the right thing. I want to trust them because they have oversight from a primary or other uh, source of regulatory uh, oversight that makes sure that they are actually doing the things that they say they're doing. And then they're not doing anything to either break the law, jeopardize our business, or most importantly, jeopardize your customers, their privacy, their safety, um, the assets that they're holding. So all of that is really, really critical. If we go to the next slide, and this is our, our last slide of content here. It's really to help you understand if you are building this business, what are some of the other things? If you said, all right, I understand from a compliance perspective what we need to do to, to build this business and how to get started, but what are some of the other things I should consider? So this is our quick checklist. The first is custody. So understanding if they're holding your assets, are they actually a qualified custodian? And for those of you who don't know what that term is, what that means is that's a designation where assets are actually held separate from uh, customer assets. And it means that the assets are bankruptcy remote. So after what we've seen over the last couple of quarters, again, what a qualified custodian means is that you are able to get your assets back if something happens. And like when we saw with the FTX collapse, because they were not a qualified custodian, but they were still custodying client assets, people are saying that they're going to be waiting a very long time to actually get those assets back because they're all getting commingled um, within you know, the, the custody that they have. And it's just going to be a very long proceeding to see what percentage of your assets you actually get back. Um, with a qualified custodian, all of that is completely separated and corporate assets and business assets or client assets are all separated. The next is, can those assets actually be lent out and rehypothecated? That's something which, again, just puts your assets at risk because they're not necessarily in the control and custody of the company. The next thing is liquidity. So if clients of yours or you yourselves are trading with this company, um, are the partners trading against the flow of your orders or are they separated from it? At Paxos, we actually don't trade against the flow of our partners. Um, we, we feel, and, and the regulators have a similar perspective, I believe, where um, this puts you in, in a, a different place where you might not necessarily have the same incentives because you're making money um, off of, of your clients in this. Um, the next point is about are the infrastructure providers that you're partnering with competing with you for clients? So if you think about some of the large crypto exchanges out there, they might also have an infrastructure business that may do similar things to Paxos and people in the competitive set. One of the questions you have to ask is, at the end of the day, if their primary business is building a retail exchange or an institutional exchange, they are there to serve the needs of those clients. And ultimately, they want as many clients on that business as possible. If you are also partnering with them to be your infrastructure provider, you are competing with them. And ultimately, we see this play out in a variety of different industries, and it doesn't usually end well for the companies that are partnering with that exchange because their motive is really to drive customer adoption and demand of their own product, not necessarily their infrastructure product. The third thing, again, as a reference, uh, you're probably getting tired of me saying like after what we've seen over the last couple of quarters, but the reality is it is on everyone's mind, whether you're a private company, a regulator, a bank, it's all the same. Um, and that's how do you know that this company is actually financially solvent and viable to be a partner with you, not just for the next six months, the next 12 months for five years, 10 years, 20 years down the line, understanding what the financial health is of your partner will really help ensure that you're partnering with somebody that can go the distance with you and really continue to build and iterate on the strategy that you have. Um, the next is, are there actually insurance policies? And we saw some questions asked about this. 
uh, that the company has in place to protect any internal or external threats that might come up, whether that's cold wallet, hot wallet, or the like. Um, and the final thing is, who are the customers that are partnered with this company? Are they the biggest companies in the world? Are they trusted financial institutions? Are they startups? I think understanding what the client mix is of the clients, uh, the partners that you're working with is really, really important. There's another element of that, which is geographical uh, distribution of clients. So if you're in Latin America, do they have other large Latin American clients are working with them? Or is it going to be the first time that they're entering in this new market? We can tell you from having done this many times in many different jurisdictions around the world, there's a lot of complexity to going into a new market. So making sure that you're working with somebody that knows how to do that really well, but also knows the nuances of operating in your market is really important. And the last thing here is understanding what is the reputation? If you talk to the partners that work with that company, what do they say about them? Are they proud to work with them? Are they happy? Does the company move quickly or does the company move slow? Does the company take things like compliance seriously or is it just marketing messaging and behind the scenes, you know, it's it's not really the way things are. So I think it's really important. And, and one of those things that you only really know when you dig in and talk to companies and, you know, partners like Paxos, we're happy to provide those introductions if clients ask about them throughout their diligence process, because we think that's one of the best ways that you can understand how a company really is to operate as a partner. Everything is always great in a sales cycle, but what really matters is when you're deeply partnered with a company and you are dependent on them and vice versa, how do they actually act? And again, through all of the volatility that we've seen, how does that part company actually stand up to the pressure? And are they set up to make sure that all their processes and the business can weather any storms you might go through? And I think you know, we're really proud at Paxos of the fact that we've been able to keep the business operating in a very healthy way and have a long runway to make sure that um, we can continue doing it for decades to come. So with that, I will pass it back to Becky for questions. Thank you so much, Alex, Sarah, and Kate. Um, obviously, we are a firm that is on the front lines of the new frontier, so hopefully some of our insights have been useful to everyone on this call. Um, we're going to open it up to some questions, and thank you all for submitting some really interesting ones. So um, the first question, and I'm going to stop my screen share so we can see each other. Uh, the first question really goes to something that Alex just hit on, which is custody. And when it comes to uh, digital assets, there's really two components of custody. There's the legal component, meaning who holds the assets. And so Paxos, as a qualified custodian, only ever holds assets for customers in the name and benefit of the customer only. Um, but when it comes to digital assets, there's a physical component. And Alex mentioned um, hot and cold wallet storage. So a wallet is really the place, the vault, where a provider is keeping the physical, the digital assets physically. So a hot wallet is um, a wallet that is connected to the internet and makes it easy to transfer uh, quickly. A cold wallet is air-gapped and disconnected from the internet so that in order to transfer those um, digital assets, the cold wallet must then be connected to the internet and um, allow for transactions. So when it comes to that, there gets there are many questions in terms of safety and security. So we got one question that is um, going to, to that uh, dynamic. What are the best practices for hot and cold wallet management? Are there suggestions or regulations for how companies should manage hot and cold wallets? Um, specifically, in Hong Kong, there was a proposal that required companies only keep 2% of hot wallets, 2% uh, of total assets in hot wallets, so connected to the internet, versus and then 98% of uh, assets in cold wallets. Um, is that commercially viable? How does Paxos and other operators think about this dynamic? Um, so I'm going to pass this over to Sarah, but then also welcome other participants to weigh in as well. Absolutely. Thanks, Becky. Um, yes, our regulators do require certain breakdowns between hot and cold storage. Paxos is focused on managing risk at all times. Uh, we can't speak to the exact details, but we do keep an operational amount of wallet of crypto in our hot wallets, while the majority is held in cold wallets. Um, this helps us manage our business on a daily basis while also keeping customer assets safely protected in cold storage. 
Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. Um, the next question goes to really the dynamic that we're all facing right now. How do you manage regulatory ambiguity with building a business? Um, so how do how should companies overcome the challenges of slow regulatory developments or a lack of regulatory clarity? It's even more challenging as clients' needs are constantly evolving. How can service providers uh, build solid and robust compliance programs with um, amongst this ambiguity and this ever-evolving landscape? Um, so, Kate, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, thanks, Becky. This is a, a question I think that we're all um, thinking through on an active and daily basis in the industry. So um, thank you for whomever sent this forward. Um, I think, of course, we are all very aware of the fact that the regulatory environment is evolving. But one of the primary reasons we wanted to run this rep, this webinar was to highlight the fact that you can still build a solid and build a robust compliance program by focusing on building the strong, um, strong compliance pillars. These are pillars that are from traditional finance, as Sarah was highlighting, BSA regulations and OFAC requirements and FinCEN requirements um, still apply to the current to financial institutions, even in the digital assets, asset space. Um, and so, and those pillars of compliance are, um, are clear, they're well established in the broader financial services sector, and there's um, applicability to what uh, is still um, happening now, even as the regulatory environment continues to evolve, um, given the introduction of new technology and new assets. So again, fundamentally, I think that this means implementing a risk, risk assessment function to understand what your risk is, what are your products and services, um, developing appropriate risk-based controls in order to respond and mitigate the risks that may be identified from your particular product and service offerings or based on the geographies in which you're operating or based on the customers to whom you're serving, um, testing those controls to make sure they're operating as intended, um, and if you identify identify any weaknesses, having remediation plans um, or management action plans in place to address those going forward, having qualified staff, um, a dedicated BSA officer, appropriate compliance personnel, um, and so on. I think that those are all key aspects that are important to a critical, that are important to a compliance program, even amidst what um, may be a, you know, a challenging regulatory environment. Thanks, Kate. I'll also add, just from, from my perspective and what I've seen with other operators out in the space, this goes back to choosing your partner. If your partner is regulated, that means that they are following the established norms of financial services and already have stood up certain compliance requirements. So knowing the structure of your partner is really crucial in also getting started. Um, okay. Uh, Alex, this one is for you. How can fintech companies in developing countries with compliant friendly practices partner with developed market companies in the digital asset industry? Thanks, Becky. So this is a really great question. Um, we have a lot of experience with this. Uh, I would say, you know, one of the biggest and uh, largest opportunity markets that Paxos has been fortunate to work with is Brazil. And, you know, Brazil's got around 220 million people and gosh, probably about 50% of them can buy crypto through one of the partners that we work with in the market between Nubank, Mercado Libre and PicPay. And, you know, Brazil, I think is one of the, this is my opinion, not an official Paxos opinion, but I think the, the Brazilian financial market is, is one of the most fast moving and the regulation there has been very open to working with digital asset companies and very innovative. Um, and so that's a market where we see a lot of our user base and, you know, we've been able to partner with those companies and work closely with them who are working with the regulators. And I think this also goes to one of the things that I was talking about earlier, which is having amazing outside counsel our regulatory council, which I don't know if they're on the call, but, uh, or if I'm allowed to, I don't know if my lawyers are going to tell me, don't mention who we actually work with. Maybe I'll mute myself and not say who it is, but um, the outside council that we work with in Sao Paulo is absolutely phenomenal. They are the company that everyone works with in that market. And when we are trying to build a partnership with somebody, or if we or our clients are trying to do something new or innovative in the market, that regulatory partner 
is absolutely critical. And what's funny is that in, in this market, they are the partner that all of the clients in that region also trust um, because they're very integrated with the bank and the regulators. Um, and so that's been really, really critical is working with the, the right partners. In this case, it happens to be a law firm, um, both from the client side, as well as, as the partner side in Paxos to make sure that what we're doing is the right thing. But I think also just to fully answer the question, understanding what the regulatory environment is in the market that the company like Paxos uh, works out of in the United States, and then understanding in the local market, the way the regulatory uh, situation is set up and just how those two things are going to interact. And to an earlier point, I was saying, understanding how is it working for other people like that? So if there is other companies in Brazil that are working with Paxos, for example, you know, talking to someone at Mercado Libre or New Bank or something like that, I think would give a, another prospective partner in Brazil a really good sense of what it's like from a regulatory perspective or a compliance perspective to be um, part of that partnership with a company like Paxos. Now, bringing it back to the U.S., um, obviously, there's a unique dynamic in that we have a federal regulator and then states are, are going forward with their own regulation. Um, so, Sarah, does that help or hinder uh, companies when, it, when we have federal regulations and then states also pursuing their own crypto regulations? This is such a great question. So timely. I feel like every week there is a hearing about this on the Hill um, and states every day are developing new regulations. Uh, regulation is critical to consumer protection in the crypto industry and it helps protect a lot of those, you know, crisis events that, you know, have mostly occurred offshore to date. Um, New York's regulations were the first in the country to holistically and prudently address the risks that may arise in the digital asset industry. Each state can and should protect its own uh, its own residents with its own rules. Um, however, it's really important for the federal regulators to set a floor for digital asset customers in all 50 states. And that way it doesn't matter where you live uh, to be protected. However, that regulation must be practical and also allow for innovation. And so, you know, the further it expands, uh, each state should definitely take its own approach, but we are also hopeful and looking for federal guidance um, to set at least minimum standards. One thing to add there that's also important is, as we often say at Paxos, licensing is not equal to regulation. So as Paxos in our business, we are licensed um, to operate in all 50 states, but that does not mean you're regulated. It's the difference of having a driver's license and then having somebody on your back watching you drive every single day. So knowing who your partners are and knowing if they are licensed or regulated can also uh, be a big difference and can really help you build your strategy moving forward. Um, another question we have is going to small businesses. Obviously, um, Paxos is a global company and most of our partners are big institutions, but you know, small businesses also want to get into this space. Um, so how can small businesses take a first step? Um, what, do, what are some of the considerations that they should be thinking about when it comes to compliance? It can feel onerous and somewhat of an insurmountable task to stand up a compliance program. So Alex, how should small businesses and small businesses that are serving other small businesses think about taking a first step? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, as I said earlier, our focus and where we spend a lot of our time is on large enterprises and, and big financial institutions like banks and trading firms. Um, but we do interact with, you know, some smaller companies and startups in the space. What I would say is hire one of the companies that I was referencing on the consulting side to help you understand, like from a compliance perspective, what are the programs or policies that you need to either build or evolve from your existing business to be able to operate in the digital asset space? And, you know, on the other side, what is the strategy that you should have in place? And I think these consulting companies are really going to be able to help you hone what is the strategy you should have and how should you go about executing it? What markets should you choose? What's the regulation? Like there's so many questions. There's honestly more questions than answers there. But I think having a trusted partner, whether it's a consulting company or someone you know who is, is in the space um, is, is a way to get started. And then the second thing I would say is just 
be a student of the market. There is, we haven't really talked that much about it, but there is no shortage of content out there and really great content, whether it's podcasts, um, you know, very formal like journal articles or uh, academic papers coming out of research universities and things like that. There is so much going on. Like we just met with somebody last week who is leading the journal for Mika, the new uh, European regulation. And this person is the editor of that journal. I didn't even know that that journal existed. Um, and so that's an example. And, and that's really, I think, a point um, maybe as we come to a close that's helpful to keep in mind is everyone in this space is always learning. Nobody has all of the answers. And I think that's one of the most fun parts of working in this industry is people come in from all sorts of different backgrounds, but there is so much content out there and so many people that are really well versed in how to do things right in this industry. So you should always be asking questions. You should never be afraid to ask a question or you know think it's a stupid question because you haven't been in the space for very long. Everyone is always still learning things. And as we said, everything is changing in, in you know hundreds of jurisdictions around the world. Everyone is just still learning what is the, the right way to do things in all of these jurisdictions. And so it's it's really uh, critical to stay informed about what's happening in the market and how to do it the right way. Yeah, one point I'll add to that is also to put things in perspective so it doesn't feel so insurmountable to Alex's point of um, constantly learning. Just remember that this space has only existed for 13 years. So that's not a lot of time to get too familiar with the big things that have happened. And before you know it, you can very quickly be up to speed and then obviously continuously learning as it evolves. Um, so last question is about the very fun topic of insurance. So um, actually, I'm going to give this to you again, Alex. Can you talk to us about how to obtain or think about insurance in this industry? Yeah, so uh, continuing the theme we've talked about before, the same you know insurance companies that you might already be working with uh, will often have a digital asset insurance program. There's also, of course, new, uh, companies that are are starting up in the digital asset space to provide insurance options. But, um, you know, for Paxo specifically, again, without getting into specific details, um, we do hold insurance against the, the crypto assets that we hold. Um, and I think it's, it's really important for people to understand and get more specifics on how that works um, in terms of getting the licensing uh, or sorry, getting the actual insurance needed to do this. You know, it's really as simple as talking to the companies, understanding what are the things that you need to have in place? How does it actually work? What is the cost for it? What's the right balance of how much money, you know, as with any insurance, like the right balance of how much you're paying in premiums versus the coverage that you're receiving for that. So there's a lot of, of great content out there to read about this topic. And, you know, if you're curious about learning more for Paxos specifically, then feel free to reach out after the webinar and we can make sure you get all the information you need. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, with that, I think we are going to end our session today. I want to thank uh, my panelists here, Kate Ironman, Sarah Breslow, Alex Gutler, all with Paxos. And thank you for everyone for joining today on your Monday morning and spending some time with us. Um, also, if you feel like you didn't get some of your questions answered, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, you can visit our website. We have a plethora of resource materials for you to dig in you can reach out to our teams and then um, you can also learn more about our products and services. So thank you very much. Um, this will be available later and we hope to hear from you all again soon. Have a good day.